Hello everyone. In this third video of our complex numbers short course series, we will be focusing on some real life applications of the complex numbers, especially in electrical engineering field. We will first take a look at AC signals, the alternate current uh, electricity and the sinusoidals. Then we will define what phasors are and we will work on polar coordinates as well as the plain old Cartesian coordinates. Then we will take a look at resistor, inductor and capacitor circuits as a primary uh, use case of complex numbers. And we will then study impedance and admittance concepts. The alternating current, or shortly AC, is now the dominant form of electrical power that is delivered to homes, commerce and industry. In the late 19th century, there was a battle between proponents of DC, direct current, and AC. AC won out due to its efficiency for long distance transmission, so it's easier and cheaper to transfer the energy using the AC. And, uh, this is because of AC is a sinusoidal current, meaning that the current reverses at regular times and has alternating positive and negative values following sinusoidal functions that we have already seen in our previous courses. Sinusoids are a particularly interesting to us, uh, I mean to electrical engineers, because there are a number of natural phenomena that are sinusoidal in, in the nature, and especially in electricity. It's also very easy, uh, a very easy signal form to generate and to transmit, and this is why AC won the battle between DC. <coughs> also, true Fourier analysis, any practical periodic function can be made by adding sinusoids, so it's it's a very powerful tool for us. And lastly, they are quite easy to handle mathematically. A sinusoidal forcing function produces both a transient and a steady state response over the long term. When the transient has died out, we say that the circuit is in a sinusoidal steady state and a sinusoidal uh, voltage uh, as an example case uh, may be represented as v of t t here is the time of course uh, v of t equals to vm the base uh, amplitude of voltage times sinus omega t from the, this wave form one characteristic is clear. The function repeats itself every t seconds. Okay, I see that the slides are missing that waveform chart, but we can use another one. Please take a look at this waveform chart here, and you will see that it's a periodic function that repeats itself as we have already discussed when we are studying the trigonometric functions. And the main reason of this uh, periodic behavior is the sinus function. Let's continue. This period can be assumed as uh, t seconds. It could be milliseconds, picoseconds, or days. So it doesn't matter. Let's assume it as t seconds and this period is always equal to 2 pi over omega where omega is the angular frequency the period is inversely related to uh, frequency which is uh, f uh, equals to 1 over t but as we have seen here we prefer to use angular frequencies 
the units of uh, regular uh, frequency f is cycle per second or shortly hertz but uh, if we use uh, omega uh, angular frequency as as our frequency parameter then uh, the unit would be radians per second and we have already proved that in one of the trigonometric courses If two sinusoids are in phase, then this means that they reach their maximum and minimum values at the same time. But this doesn't mean their uh, amplitudes uh, would be the same. So their maximum and minimum values could be different, but the time slot they reach that their maximum and minimum points would be the same. Sinusoidal uh, signals may be expressed as sinus or cosinus and there is of course a conversion between them. A sinus omega t plus or minus 180 degrees would be equal to minus sinus omega t and cosinus of omega t plus minus 180 degrees would be minus cosinus omega t whereas sinus of omega t plus or minus 90 degrees would be equal to plus or minus cosinus omega t and cosinus of omega t plus or minus 90 degrees would be plus or minus sinus omega t that that uh, sign of the resulting sinus or cosinus function depend on the input of the uh, sinus or cosinus functions on the left hand side of these equations. Let's take a look at the electrical waveforms. A general expression for the sin sinusoid for the voltage of a component or a circuit or a signal could be given as V of T equals to Vm stands for V maximum or the amplitude of that voltage times sinus omega T plus phi where phi is the phase angle omega is the angular frequency T is the period uh, sorry, T is the actual time variable and the sinus function is the general form of the waveform. And here in the charts you see that whenever omega T, uh, the angular frequency times the time equals to pi or 2 pi or 3 pi or multiples of pi then the function becomes zero. This is because uh, sinus function becomes zero. And on the uh, time domain we will get zeros for the same function at the points of t over 2 half period or full period t. More generally, we need to account for relative timing of one wave versus another. And this can be done by including a phase shift. So what we did not see in these previous charts was the phase shift. So they are in phase. But to shift a given signal or compare uh, shifted versions of the same signal, we will need uh, the phi uh, phase shift variable. Let's consider the two sinusoids V1 of t equals to Vm times sinus omega t and V2 of t equals to Vm, the same amplitude, times sinus omega t plus phi, the angle of the phase shift. And now in the chart below we will see these two versions of the almost same signal the one with the 
continuous line is the original one v1 vm sinus omega t and the one with the dashed lines is v2 so when we add phi into the sinus function we shift the signal to left side or right side depending on the value of the phi so it will be the same signal but with a different phase value we have a very basic example to recap given a sinusoid 5 times sinus 4, 4 pi th t minus 60 degrees and calculate its amplitude, phase, angle, frequency, period, and frequency. So this just fits in the uh, given function of v here. So we can just put the values on the variables and we will get the solution. So until here, complex numbers seem irrelevant, but actually they are very, very relevant. And this is, this is where complex numbers will be very useful. Apart from the standard rectangular form, another powerful method for representing the sinusoids is the phasor format. But in order to proceed with the phasor form, uh, we need to cover some complex numbers basics again. A complex number z can be represented in its uh, standard rectangular form as z equals to x plus jy. Here we use particularly the J formation, uh, J notation for the imaginary part because we don't want to confuse it with the current uh, symbol of I. But uh, this is exactly the same as I, so there is no difference here. Just in order to prevent such a uh, confusion with the current and other circuit equations. So this is the basic rectangular formula for the uh, basic complex number. But it can also be written in uh, polar coordinates or so-called exponential form as z equals to r with a phase an angle of phi and which is equal to r times e to the power of j times phi. This is the exponential form of the number z, which is defined in its rectangular form as x plus jy, where x is the real part and jy is the imaginary part. These different forms can be interconverted from one form to the another form. Let's first start with a rectangular form and try to convert it to the polar form. In order to, in order to do this, we should uh, draw a diagram uh, which is shown on the right part and we should indicate the real number, the real part of the complex number and the imaginary part of the complex number. And uh, most frequently we write the uh, real part on the x-axis, the uh, horizontal axis, and imaginary part on the vertical axis. So these axes are called real axis and imaginary axis for this purpose. By doing this, we can find the z, the point that represents the z, the complex number uh, that we are working on, on the Cartesian coordinates. And the distance from the origin to the point of z would be our r value. And this r value uh, can be found as the square root of x square plus y square, just as a regular distance parameter. And the angle phi can be found as arctangent of y over x. This uh, relation comes from the trigonometric identities that we have learned in our previous courses. So in order to find phi, 
we have to find the angle that uh, whose tangent is y over x and the real value of phi will depend on the real values of y and x of course and likewise from polar coordinates to rectangular form goes as follows x would be equal to r times cosinus phi and y would be r times sinus phi this comes from the unit circle and right angle triangle let's revisit some mathematical operations of complex numbers let's assume z1 and z2 are complex numbers and look at addition of these two so z1 plus z2 would be x1 plus x2 uh, the sum of the real parts plus j times y1 plus y2 sum of imaginary parts subtraction would be similar z1 minus z2 would be x1 minus x2 plus j times y1 minus y2 multiplication can be can be done quite easy using the polar forms so for addition and subtraction we prefer to use a rectangular form the Cartesian coordinates but for multiplication it's quite easy to use uh, polar forms so z1 times z2 is only r1 times r2 where the angle uh, the phase angle would be phi1 plus phi2 so we multiply the distances but we only add the phi values of uh, these two subject complex numbers division would be very similar z1 over z2 equals to r1 over r2 where phase angle would be phi1 minus phi2 so when mul multiplying we add uh, the phase angles when dividing we subtract the phase angles and a reciprocal uh, operation would be 1 over z which is equal to 1 over r where the phase angle would be minus phi and square root is also easy with polar forms square root of z is square root of r the distance from 0 to the point, the point of z and the phase angle would be phi over 2 And the complex conjugate z star would be x minus jy assuming that uh, z is x plus jy complex conjugate would be x minus jy which is equal to r with the phase angle of minus phi so we just change the angle but we keep the distance r this magnitude would not change but we just tilt the angle and in uh, exponential form this would be r times e to the minus j phi phasers or in, in a longer form phase vectors are a representation of sinusoidal wave whose amplitude a and phase phi and frequency omega are time invariant so of course we observe a change a variance in in time but this variance is periodic and only depending on the sinus or cosinus function in the definition so the amplitude a do not change we observe that the output chains but this is totally due to the nature of cosinus or sinus function we do not change a or the phase angle or the frequency a times cosinus omega t plus phi is equal to the real part of a times 
e to the i t i phi times e to the i omega t. It's pretty amazing, right? On the right side, we see three different uh, waveforms with different amplitudes, but they are in phase, which means that at the same time they reach their maximums and minimums. The idea of a phase representation is based on Euler's identity, which is e to the plus minus j phi equals to cosinus phi plus or minus j sinus phi. From this, we can represent a sinusoid as the real component of a vector in the complex plane. The length of the vector is the amplitude of the sinusoid, and the vector v in polar form is at an angle phi with respect to the positive real axis, as we can see on the chart on the right side. A phasor is a complex number that represents the amplitude and phase of a sinusoid, so it's just another form of representing uh, the amplitude and phase of a sinusoid. It can be shown in one of the following three forms. A rectangular form for a complex number would be z equals to x plus jy which is equal to r times cosinus phi plus j times sinus phi. This is the usual rectangular form. And both representations are rectangular either. Polar form is z is equal to r where angle phi is also stated And the exponential form would be z equals to the r times e to the j phi, where r equals to square root of x square plus y square and phi equals to arc tangent, so reverse of tangent, y over x from the graph above. Here you can stop the video and try to solve these basic uh, questions. Uh, we have two examples here and we also provide the solutions so you can just pause here and try to find the next steps until the solution. Phasers are typically represented at t equals to zero but it's it's not uh, always the case, so please pay attention to that. As such, the transformation between time domain to phasor domain would be V of t equals to Vm times cosine omega t plus phi, uh, which is the time domain representation, to V equals to Vm with the phase angle of phi and this is the phasor domain representation here we assume that t equals to zero but occasionally it may be given differently and here below we will see these representations the right side the chart on the right side is for the time domain representation and the chart on the left side uh, the circle chart is the phasor domain representation of the same uh, V signal. This example would be nice to understand what's going on better. The example gives us a current value i. So this is not the uh, imaginary number i, this is the current i. Uh, equals to 6 times cosinus 50 t minus 40 a amperes uh, sorry 40 degree amperes and voltage v equals to minus 4 times sinus 30 t plus 50 degrees volts 
Here Dukasin asks us uh, to convert these uh, sinusoidal representations to phasor representations. And for the standard phasor form, we assume that T is zero and continue our uh, conversion using that. And please uh, keep in mind that cosinus omega T plus 90 degrees is the same as minus sinus omega t and cosinus omega t minus 90 degrees is the same as sinus omega t. So these identities would be helpful in solving this question. The first one is easier. Uh, the magnitude 6 will be kept as 6. So no, there is no change on, on that one. And the angle would be minus 40 degrees because when t is accepted as 0, then 50t would be 0. So the phase angle would be minus 40 degrees and i, the current, would be uh, 6 with phase angle minus 40 degrees ampere. For the second one, there is a little trick. Uh, we should convert um, minus sinus function to cosinus function and since minus sinus a and uh, arbitrary number a would be equal to cosinus a plus 90 degrees there is a 90 degrees shift so from this point vt v of t would be 4 times cosinus 30t plus 50 degrees plus 90 degrees and in this case if uh, t is 0 then we would get 4 times cosinus 140 degrees volts and the transformation to phasor form would be v equals to 4 with uh, phase angle 140 degrees and here is a handy table for transforming various time domain sinusoids into phasor domain vm times cosinus omega t plus phi in the time domain would be vm with angle phi in the phasor domain and vm times sinus omega t plus phi in the time domain would be vm with angle phi minus 90 degrees in the phasor domain likewise im the current value im times cosinus omega t plus phi would be im with angle of uh, theta, uh, sorry, they, they use theta here uh, to distinguish voltage formula to from the uh, current formula. So I am cosine omega t plus theta would be I am theta, and I am times sine omega t plus theta would be I am where the phase angle would be theta minus 90 degrees because of the shift difference between cosinus and sinus functions. Note that the frequency of the phasor is not explicitly, sh explicitly shown in the phasor diagram. For this reason, the phasor domain is also known as the frequency domain. And what's more interesting is applying a derivative to a phasor yields so dv on dt the derivative on time domain would be equivalent to j omega v in the phasor domain and the same goes for the integral applying an integral to a phasor yields uh, v on j omega and it's the equivalent of integral v dt on the time domain We will now move towards the electrical circuits. Each circuit element has a relationship between its current and voltage depending on time, frequency, amplitude and phase. And this relation can be mapped into phasor relationships very simply for resistors, capacitors and inductors. For the resistors, it's, it's the simplest. The voltage and current are related via the Ohm's law. As such, the voltage and current are in phase with each other. 
Now please look at the top right uh, figure of the, the simple electrical circuit that contains one voltage source and one resistor. The left part is the time domain representation and the right part is the phasor domain representation. As you can see, both are almost 100% identical. The time varying current I passes through the resistor R and the voltage of the source and the circuit can be modeled as small v equals to small i times r where i is uh, the current, not complex number. And on the right side, in the phasor domain representation, we have capital I as the current and R again for the resistor and the voltage would be capital I times R. So they are identical. And on the chart uh, at the bottom, we will see that real part and imaginary part of uh, both I and V values, the current and voltage values, have the same phase angle. Although their amplitudes uh, are different, their angle is the same. For inductors, it's not exactly like that. They, on the other hand, have a phase shift between their voltage and the current passes through them. In this case, the voltage leads the current by 90 degrees. Or one says that the current lags the voltage, which is the standard convention. This is represented on the phasor diagram by a positive phase angle between the voltage and current, which can be seen on the bottom uh, chart on the right side. Here we see that the angle from from the uh, x-axis, the horizontal axis to i is smaller than that of v and this clearly means that voltage comes first and the current follows later. Let's look at the top figure. On the left side we have the time domain representation of the time varying current i, small i, and we can give it as small v voltage, time, time domain voltage, v equals to L times di on dt. On the other hand, on the right side, we have uh, phasor domain i, capital I, and cap, uh, capital V. And capital V, the uh, phasor domain the voltage, equals to J omega L I. Here, by using the phasor domain representation, we can get rid of uh, the derivatives and get a simpler representation. It's pretty much similar for the capacitor. The only difference here is uh, the phase shift between voltage and current. They have the opposite phase relationship as compared to inductors. In their case, the current leads the voltage, so it's just the opposite case. The current comes first, then the voltage appears. In the phasor diagram on the right side, this corresponds to a negative phase angle between the voltage and current. Here, uh, unlike the inductor, the angle between the horizontal axis and V is smaller than that of I. And when we look at the uh, circuit figures on the left side for the time domain, we get small i equals to C times dV over dt, so time derivative of voltage. Whereas uh, on the right side for the phasor domain we get capital I equals to J omega C times V. Here again we can get rid of the derivative by using the phasor format. 
and let's summarize the voltage current relationships for resistor element on the time domain voltage is r times i and on the frequency domain it's again r times i so it's basically the same on both domains and for inductor voltage is l times di on dt so time derivative of current but on the frequency domain voltage is just j omega l times i so there's no derivatives here for capacitor i equals to c times dv over dt time derivative of voltage on the other hand on frequency domain we have v equals to i over j omega c here we have a very good example question it says find the voltage v of t in a circuit described by the integral differential equation given using the phasor approach and the equation is 2 times dv on dt plus 5v plus 10 times integral v dt equals to 50 times cosinus 5t minus 30 degrees so by using the relations we already learned in the previous slides we can solve this easily first in order to get rid of these uh, derivatives and, and integrals we should use the phasor format otherwise it could be quite complicated and by using the phasor form for each term here uh, as shown in this table we can get 2 times j omega v plus 5v plus 10 over j omega v equals to 50 with the phase angle of minus 30 degrees where omega is 5 and omega is obtained from the given equation where it says 50 cosinus 5t minus 30 so here uh, 5 is the omega because it should be omega t if we continue to the next step uh, we can use the v parenthesis and here v times 10j plus 5 minus j times 10 over 5 would be uh, equal to v times 5 plus 8j and this would be equal to 50 with the angle of minus 30 degrees here with simplifications we get v equals to 5.3 where the angle is minus 88 degrees and we can from from this uh, phasor form we can convert to the time domain again and then we will get v of t equals to 5.3 times cosinus 5t minus 88 degrees volts so the exact value of this voltage would be related to the time t but it will be periodic again let's proceed forward and talk a bit about impedance and admittance it's also possible to expand the ohm's basic law to capacitors and inductors in time domain this would be quite tricky and very hard as the ratios of voltage and current uh, are always changing uh, per time but in frequency domain they do not change per time so it's more straightforward the impedance of a circuit element is the ratio of the phasor voltage to the phasor current so it's still the voltage over current z the impedance would be v over i or alternatively v equals to z times i so it's very similar to the ohm's law for uh, resistors but also valid for capacitors and inductors when we are talking on the uh, time uh, frequency domain not time domain 
And the admittance is simply the inverse of impedance. It's not something uh, very different. It's important to realize that in, in frequency domain, the values obtained for the impedance are only valid at that frequency. So when frequency chains, uh, the frequency of the AC source chains, uh, these relations won't be uh, true anymore. And changing to a new frequency, of course, we require recalculating these values because all these values of uh, inductors and capacitors, the impedance values, would depend on the frequency because let me show uh, this equation here. Here, except for R, uh, for L and C, we get uh, V equals to J omega L I and V equals to I over J omega C. Here in the formula, we have omega, which is the angular frequency, which includes F, the regular frequency. So when frequency changes, these impedance values would change also. And please keep in mind that inductors make short circuits at DC where frequency is zero and make open circuits at very, very high frequencies. Conversely, capacitors would make open circuits at DC where frequency is zero and would behave like short circuits at very high frequencies. As a complex quantity, the impedance may also be expressed in the rectangular form, and the separation of the real and imaginary components is quite useful. The real part is the resistance value, just like as in a resistor, and the imaginary component is called the reactance, and it's represented by capital X. And when this is positive, we say the impedance is inductive, and when it is uh, negative, then we say that the impedance is capacitive. Admittance, similarly, uh, being the reciprocal of the impedance, is also a complex number and it is measured in units of Siemens. Um, the real part of the admittance is called the conductance and represented by capital G, whereas the imaginary part is called the susceptance and shown by capital B. These are all expressed in Siemens, and the impedance and admittance components can be related to each other because G is R over R square plus X square, for any component and B is minus X over R square plus X square where R is the resistance and X is the reactance of that particular component. And let's look at impedance and admittance of uh, these uh, RLC uh, elements. The impedance for resistor would be just R and the admittance would be 1 over R. But for inductor, impedance Z would be J omega L and admittance Y would be 1 over J omega L. Whereas for, for a capacitor Z, the impedance would be 1 over J omega C and admittance would be equal to J omega C. Here we have a very good example question with a step-by-step -step solution, so I will not dive deep into this, but I strongly suggest you to stop the video and solve the question and check your answer. Here what you should do is, using, uh, using these uh, impedance and admittance relations and make the uh, conversions. For the impedance relations, you can use the uh, given capacitance value and the resistance value on the uh, right figure and make the transformations pretty straightforward using the phasor form.
And Kirchhoff's laws are also quite valid in the frequency domain as well as in time domain. A powerful aspect of phasers is that Kirchhoff's laws apply to them as well. This means that a circuit transformed to frequency domain can be evaluated by the same methodology developed for Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current laws. And one consequence, I wouldn't say it's a consequence, but a natural phenomenon is that there will likely be complex values. And lastly, let's look at impedance combinations. Once in frequency domain, the impedance elements are generalized and thought of uh, black boxes. And these combinations will follow the rules for resistors. So we can behave uh, impedance, uh, co impedance of the com co components as resistance of resistors. If, if we have cascading uh, or serially connecting uh, connected elements then just like resistors we can add the impedance values of these components and find the eventual uh, impedance value of the circuit so in a serial circuit equivalent z would be z1 plus z2 plus z whatever plus zn and here, all these elements in, in the series can act like a voltage divider and the voltage on each component can be found using the voltage divider formulas. And for this example figure on the right side, the voltage on the component 1 would be Z1 over Z1 plus Z2 times V. And similarly, V2, the voltage on the second component, would be Z2 over Z1 plus Z2 times V. In a parallel combination, just like a, a resistor uh, combination, we can uh, combine the inverse of impedance values. So 1 over Z equivalent would be equal to 1 over Z1 plus 1 over Z2 plus 1 over Z whatever plus 1 over Zn. Just like resistors, nothing so special. We have another good question here and let's look at this. Question says, find the input impedance of the circuit in figure and assume that the circuit operates at angular frequency omega equals to 50 radians per second. The parameters of the components and the circuit is given clearly on the right side. And let's assume that Z1 is the impedance of the 2 millifarad capacitor, Z2 equals to impedance of the 3 ohm resistor in series with the 10 millifarad capacitor. So we have two resistors here. And Z3 is the impedance of the 0.2 Henry inductor in series with the 8 ohm resistor. Then Z1 would be 1 over J omega C from the definition and this would be 1 over J50 times 2 times 10 to the minus third and the result would be minus J10 ohms. For Z2 we get 3 plus because the resistance of resistor is equal is equivalent to its uh, impedance so for resistors impedance and resistors are the same so this is why we write 3 here without any conversion and z2 would be 3 plus 1 over j omega c and this would be 3 plus 1 over j50 times 10 times 10 to the minus third and the result would be 3 minus J2 ohms. For Z3 we get 8 from the resistor plus J omega L which yields us 8 plus J50 times 0 0.2 which is eventually 8 plus J10 ohms. And the input impedance is as you see Z plus 1 Z2 parallels Z3. So Z2 and Z3 here are parallel 
and Z1 is serial to these ones. And here we get minus J10 plus uh, 3 minus J2 times 8 plus J10 on the numerator and 11 plus J8 for the denominator. And eventually we will get minus J10 plus 3.22 minus J1.07 ohms. And when we simplify this term, we will get Z input as 3.22 minus J times 11.07 ohms as a result. So it's, it's very fun, it's very simple, not complicated. And finally, be, of course, you, you don't have to memorize it, but you it's better if you know that this can happen, this is possible. Uh, if, if the uh, given circuit is not parallel nor serial, it could be uh, one of some complicated forms, and delta y transformation is, uh, delta y form is one of them. And delta y form could be transformed into a serial or parallel uh, circuit. And this is already uh, done easily for resistors. And it's also quite easy for impedance components. Components that have impedance values other than their resistance values. And it's uh, pretty straightforward and the same. I will not go deep uh, into the details, but it's better if you know that it's possible with uh, components other than resistor. And this is called delta Y transformation or delta star transformation. That's all for today. Actually, uh, there are lots of applications of uh, complex numbers complex vectors, complex matrices, but we have very limited time, so it's uh, only enough for the basics. If there is demand, if people ask for uh, for other series or to continue these uh, slides. In fact, there are much more applications of complex numbers complex vectors and complex matrices but we had quite a limited time slot for this course series and only could only give the very basics and fundamentals if there is demand from our professors and students or any of the audience we can c continue to the lessons thank you very much for listening bye